Hello, everybody. This is Grandmaster Robert Hungaski for ChessLecture.com. And today I wanted to cover a recent game that was played in the first really important elite level tournament that has taken place after the pandemic has put everything on hold for the past six months or so. And this is the Altevox tournament held in Norway, which saw Magnus Carlsen still reign supreme. He won the tournament. His games, though, were another matter. And in fact, Carlsen was delivered his first loss in over two years. And when it rains, it pours, because after his loss against Duda, which we will be covering in this video, he also lost to Aronian, who, in my opinion, showed the best form of the tournament. Aronian played some really great games, especially end games, especially rook and pawn end games, which I consider to be Aronian's specialty and really second to none in the world currently. I think Aronian is probably one of the best end game players out there. So... First things first, I want to jump in and talk about this game between Duda and Carlsen because aside from being an important end to an impressive streak, it's also an opening that I've been keeping an eye on for a while and I was happy to see it being played by Carlsen. So even though he lost, I think he showed some really interesting ideas for Black in a somewhat obscure line of the Karo Khan. So after the moves e4, c6, d4, d5, knight c3, d takes e4, knight takes e4, knight f6. So all the rage has been bishop f5, and this has completely dominated opening analysis and practice. And I actually think that, although it's a very reliable line for black, that white has a lot of interesting resources at his disposal. Knight f6, on the other hand, is a much more practical line for black. And the point is that after knight takes f6, black will play e takes f6. This recapture, I've seen a lot of Karpov games where Karpov would play the English as white. And when he would have his knight on f3 captured either by an opponent's knight or bishop, he would sometimes, instead of taking with the fianchettoed bishop on g2, would take with the e-pawn and then play f4. And this is a very interesting idea because what black is saying in this structure is, I'm not going to occupy the center physically. Rather, I'm going to open up files to put pressure on the center. And Black's middle game strategy will be one that will rely heavily on central control more than central occupation. So after E takes F6, the pawns on C6 and F6 will do a great job at containing White's center and also at dominating White's minor pieces while black finishes his development and brings the rooks to the center. So after c3, white is trying to play bishop d3 and not hang the pawn on d4. So bishop d6, bishop d3, castles, queen c2. And here white is trying to provoke a weakening of black's king side, either by a move like g6, which looks very dangerous since it allows white to play h4, capitalizing on this hook immediately. And then also we have h6, which is also a little bit suspect here because white will also try to take advantage of the hook on h6. This might take a little bit longer, but after something like knight e2, bishop e3, castle, queen side, it will take a little bit longer, but white will still try to capitalize on this hook on h6 by preparing a pawn storm on the king side. So the latest word on this variation goes rook e8 and after knight e2 the move h5 and h5 is a move that looks absolutely insane because you're assuming that white is trying to castle queenside and that is a good assumption because that's exactly what white is trying to do so you would think why would putting my pawn on h5 be a good idea it's just going to be an easy target but that's really not the case the pawn on h5 is actually incredibly useful not just as a way of defending against the threat of bishop takes h7, but it will actually do a great job at containing white's pawn storm on the king side. So this pawn on h5 is going to play an active role in restricting white's king side initiative. So now white continues with the idea of castling queen side, bishop e3, knight d7, and now 
Castle Queenside. And this is the critical position of the variation. This position has been played many, many times. According to my database, it's been played 162 times. The move Knight F8 has been played 152 games of those 162, so it is by far the main line. But that is not what Carlson chose to play. By the way, I did a little research, and I don't really see any problem with Knight F8 either. It's kind of an interesting discussion, and it will help us understand Carlson's move better to see what's going on after Knight F8. Because we might think that White's idea is to play on the king side, but that would be a mistake. In fact, it would take White too long and provide White with too little to spend time on moves like h3 and try to prepare g4. For example, Black would play bishop e6, and after something like g4, bishop d5, attacking the rook on h1, the rook has to move, let's say, something like rook h to g1. And after h4, this is a great example of how this h-pawn is going to play an important role in the containment strategy that black is going for on the king side. The h-pawn keeps the g-file closed from h4, and it keeps the pawn on h3 fixed. And black would like nothing better than perhaps to play knight e6 and knight g5. So these positions are actually better for black. Black has awesome centralization, pressure on the e-file, and black is going to prepare his own pawn storm after moves like b5, a5, a4, and b4. So like I said, this is already a better position for black. So what white needs to realize, if he's going to play this line, is that his main counterplay is not on the king side, but rather in the center of the board. So after, let's say, the move king b1, for example, black again develops the bishop to e6. The d5 square is an incredibly important pivot point for black. And now, after pawn to c4, we're going to see that white's main idea is to carry out the d5 pawn break. And black is going to try to deter white from doing this. Basic rule of thumb, if white manages to open up the d file, terrible things will happen to black. For example, already here, if black tries to be cute and sacrifice a pawn to open up the queen side, white will play d5. And we see that the play in the center is favorable to white. After something like c takes d5, some common ideas for white here are to play c5 and then take on b5 and play knight d4. And black's attention is diverted from the queen side and focused on the center of the board. And that's white's real strategy. So for example, the best move here happens to be rook c8. And now after knight c3, again, trying to reinforce the idea of d5, for example, if b5, again, d5 is uh, very strong. And if c takes d5, knight takes b5, we see that d file is opening up and white is getting a very strong position. However, the key move, and to make a long story short, that I think gives black a very good position here, is the move of bishop to b4, undermining the knight and dispelling a misconception in this position that the dark squared bishop is black's good bishop. This is not true. Black's most important bishop is the light squared bishop because black's middle game strategy is a light square strategy. Right, pawn on h5, the other pawn is trying to get to b5. For example, if a3, bishop takes, queen takes, b5, black gets a great position. The difference here is that after d5, c takes d5, c5, the bishop on d6 isn't hanging, so black can just protect the pawn on b5. Everything is holding, and if black manages to trade the light squared bishops, then we're going to see a common theme arise for this variation, which is going to be the theme of good knight against bad bishop. That bishop on e3, not great. 